We will uh, go ahead and get started here. I'll let uh, Dr. McLeod introduce his topic for our uh, faculty colloquium. First one of the spring semester will be uh, doing another, Lord willing, next month, and I'll tell you maybe a little bit about that at the end. Let me just open with a word of prayer, and then I will turn it right over to Dr. McLeod. Father in heaven, we thank you for an opportunity to uh, consider these things from your word this afternoon. We pray for um, your help and your spirit's guidance in being able to think through the miracles of our Lord and uh, by what power he uh, accomplished those miracles, the purpose of the miracles. And so we pray for Dr. McLeod now. Thank you for the research that he's done into this topic and pray for your blessing on the hour ahead. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do have a handout. If you could. I'd be happy to distribute that. We only need a few of them, I think. Okay, thank you for being here this afternoon uh, for this uh, faculty colloquium, and we'll get right into it. The title of the lecture or the uh, presentation is The Miracles of Jesus, Modus Operandi, and Raison d'etre. And the first footnote explains that uh, these are Latin terms, raison d'etre, meaning reason for being. Modus operandi uh, has to do with uh, the method of operating, the mode of operating. There can be no question that our Lord's miracles frequently produce an overwhelming impression of the divine glory embodied in his person. After the stilling of the storm, his disciples said, what kind of man is this, that even the winds of the sea uh, and the sea obey him? After the miracle of the large catch of fish, Peter said to him, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. It seems to have dawned upon Peter that he was in the presence of a divine person. In classic apologetics, both Catholic and Protestant, the miracles of Christ are used to demonstrate his divine nature. Calvin declared how plainly and clearly is his deity shown in his miracles. It is worth noting, however, that when the apostles performed miracles, they too were thought to be divine. The ability to perform miracles does not in itself prove deity. The fact that his miracles impressed people that our Lord was divine, which he was, does not mean that this was the purpose of these miracles. Uh, this is a lecture, by the way, that I have given when I teach Christology, and the second footnote uh, points out that I, previous to this lecture, give a strong defense of the deity of Christ. The statement of the problem. First, were Jesus' miracles intended to prove his deity, or were they intended to prove his messiahship? Second, were his miracles performed with his own essential divine powers, or were they performed with power derived from the Holy Spirit? Uh, and I again affirm these questions are not intended to deny Christ's essential deity. We have spent some time, or I spent time in the course, demonstrating from scripture that our Lord Jesus Christ was truly the second person of the Trinity. Two different answers. It's often argued that the miracles of Christ were performed using his own essential deity and were intended to prove his deity. Others have argued that our Lord's miracles were intended to prove his messiahship and were performed using power derived from the Holy Spirit. A defense of a solution, statement of the view. 
At his baptism, Jesus was anointed to his messianic office by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon him at that time to empower him for the duties of that office. Luke writes, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Notice, God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. While on earth, Christ functioned as the Messiah, the servant of the Lord. During his ministry, there was not an emptying of divine attributes by the Son of God. Our Lord did not lay his attributes aside. Rather, there was, as Walbert put it, the voluntary non-use of his divine attributes. The miracles that Jesus performed were intended to prove that he truly was the Messiah, the Anointed One. From his prison cell, John the Baptist sent two of his disciples to Jesus with a question. Are you the coming one, that is the Messiah, or do we look for someone else? At that time, the Lord was performing miracles of healing, and he sent this message to John. Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. In our Lord's message, of course, were allusions to Isaiah 35 and 61, well-known messianic texts. His point is obvious, the one who performs messianic miracles must be the Messiah. He performed these miracles in the power of the Spirit. His power to perform miracles was not his own essential divine power. Rather, his power to perform miracles was official. Like the prophets and apostles, he performed his miracles with a derived power and authority. To say that Christ was God simply because he performed miracles is to ignore the fact that Moses and the prophets performed miracles as well. In fact, Elijah and Elisha raised people from the dead. The miracles of Jesus no more prove his deity than the miracles of Moses prove his deity. In fact, the Pharisees and the people regarded the miracles of our Lord as less than those of Moses and as insufficient to prove that he was the Messiah to say nothing of his deity. According to the Gospels, few thought he was divine because of his miracles. At the most, they were convinced he was a prophet or the Messiah. These observations in no way imply that our Lord could not have performed miracles using his own divine power. Now I want to go now to a footnote, footnote 9. Could he not have performed his miracles using his own inherent power if he wanted to? A student of mine once asked. I sometimes tell students when they ask me questions or make points that if there are good points, I may even put them in a footnote. <laughs> sometimes I even name them. <laughs> the implication of the student's question was, well, of course he could have. Yet this begs the question. The correct way to phrase the question is, could he not have performed his miracles using his own inherent power if the Father had wanted him to? The point that needs to be emphasized is that Christ lived his life on earth as the servant of the Lord. He lived in dependence upon and in obedience to the Father. Yet even this second question may be moot. It seems to suggest that at any time during his earthly sojourn, the Father could have prompted him to use his own divine powers. Philippians 2, 6-8 seems to imply, however, that his modus operandi was determined in the divine councils before he came into the world. Westcott offers a cautionary note here. In his study of the fathers, he found them suggesting that our Lord operated at one time with his divine powers and another with his human. He wrote, it is unscriptural, though the practice is supported by strong patristic authority, to regard the Lord during his historic life as acting now by his human and now by his divine nature only. The two natures were inseparably combined in the unity of his person. In all things, he acts personally. And as far as it is revealed to us, 
His greatest works during his earthly life were wrought by the help of the Father through the energy of a humanity enabled to do all things in fellowship with God. Back to page three. Um, he could have, were this the will of his father, rather the New Testament indicates that he lived his life on earth as Yahweh's obedient servant. Further, he lived in dependence upon the spirit who anointed him. Defense of the view. Now, the following texts should be read with care. It should be noted that while Jesus attributed his miracles to the Spirit of God, the uh, Matthew says he cast out demons by the Spirit of God. It should be noted that while Jesus attributes his miracles to the Spirit of God, the Pharisees attributed them to Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Jesus' response to this charge can only be understood if he healed a demon-possessed man with power derived from the Spirit. He calls their charge blasphemy against the Spirit. He goes on to say that a word against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Why is there greater guilt in sin against the Holy Ghost than in sin against Holy Spirit, excuse me, a little King James there, uh, against the Holy Spirit than in sin against the Son of Man. It cannot lie in a claim that the greater dignity of the Holy Spirit, for the Son of God is equal in divine dignity to the Spirit. The answer lies in the true incarnation of the Son. He walked among the people in the form of a servant. His divine glory was veiled. It is in this fact that grounds for pardon for sin against him can be found. The Pharisees might be forgiven for failing to grasp his dignity while in the flesh. In attacking his miracles, however, they were rejecting works clearly done by divine power. Our Lord clearly attributes his healing miracle here to the spirit and not to the divine power inherent in the Son of Man. Luke 4. 14 through 18. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout all the surrounding district. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. That little, that little uh, line, recovery of sight to the blind, is not in the Hebrew text, but uh, Luke here quotes the Septuagint, which does include the, uh, the healing of the blind. Luke 5, 17, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. I would interpret texts like 6, 19 in light of what is said here in 5, 17. And, um, Luke eleven twenty. he cast out demons by the finger of God. John 11, the raising of Lazarus, Jesus thanks his father for hearing him, that is, for enabling him to raise Lazarus. John 14, 10, speaking to Philip, Jesus says, the father abiding in me does his works. Acts 2, 22, Peter argues that Jesus was a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs. What is significant is the following phrase, which God performed through him. Acts 10, 38, here Peter refers to our Lord's baptism and says that at that time, God anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power. He follows this with a reference to Christ's healing ministry. Why did God need to anoint our Lord with the Holy Spirit and with power? The answer is that Christ carried out his earthly ministry as the Lord's anointed servant. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit to perform his messianic miracles. Now, footnote, uh, we'll read some footnotes here. 
Uh, footnote 15. You know, this is a somewhat of a brethren audience. I need authority beyond the scriptures. <laughs> <laughs> J.N. Darby commented, he acted through life by the Holy Ghost. He says, if I by the Spirit cast out devils, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And again, he says, the Father that dwelleth in me doeth his works. He worked miracles by the Holy Ghost. Darby recognized the mystery of Christ's incarnate person, a spirit, a servant, yet fully God. Of his human servanthood, Darby wrote, he can do nothing of himself. He is obedient. He does immediately add, he is the power of God and quickens to whom he will. Darby's disciple, William Kelly, agreed. He wrote, it was his perfection as man in the midst of an evil and ruined world to do not miracles only, but everything in the Spirit's power. Kelly observes that the same Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit that indwells Jesus has been given to us, and we have to follow in his steps endowed with the same Spirit now given uh, to us in his grace. One other note. Evangelical theologian Colin Brown says the miracles of Christ should be understood in the context of a spirit Christology. That is, the miracles were performed by the Messiah in the power of the Holy Spirit. Commenting on Acts 2.22 and 10.38, Brown writes, My point here is certainly not to deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. Uh, I found another, another uh, defender of this view in John Owen who uh, takes this view, and uh, someone commenting on Owen says, this view has been fiercely opposed by people who uh, believe they're defending the deity of the divinity of Christ. And so that's why I promote, uh, those who hold this view have to keep saying what Brown says. My point here is certainly not to deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. It is rather to note how the New Testament approaches his person and to try to grasp how the miracles of Jesus fit into the picture. Jesus' miracles are given a prominent place, but they are not uh, attributed to Jesus as the second person of the Trinity, although he is the second person of the Trinity. They are presented as manifestations of his, uh, not pre presented as manifestations of his personal divinity, in both passages, Jesus is clearly a man. To be precise, he's identified as Jesus of Nazareth. The stress falls on what God did through him and on God being with him. And we can uh, skip that and go to the next page. Jesus Christ is truly the eternal son of God, yet while on earth, it was apparently the Father's will that he live his human life in complete dependence upon God. These comments and observations are not intended to deny the full deity of Christ. Rather, they are intended to explain the mode of his performing miracles during the time of his humiliation on earth when he functioned as God's anointed servant. Many verses in the gospel speak of Jesus healing people. The only <coughs> verses, and this is critical, the only verses, however, which speak of the modus operandi of the miracles seem to suggest that our Lord performed them with a derived power, power derived by the Holy Spirit. Now another footnote, footnote 18, make reference to my revered teachers who disagreed with me, but now they're in heaven and they have changed their minds. <laughs> the late Dallas Seminary President and Chancellor John F. Walvoord wrote, on two specific occasions, Christ is revealed to have performed his miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit. In these instances, Christ chose voluntarily to be dependent upon the power of the Father and the Holy Spirit to perform his miracles. In view of the fact that this is mentioned only twice and hundreds of miracles were performed, it would seem clear that Christ exercised his own power when he chose to do so as, for instance, when he commanded the waves to be still and cause Lazarus to come forth from the tomb at his command. Charles Ryrie takes the same position, took the same position. Three observations are in order. One, 
Warren and Ryrie, revered teachers of the present writer, have overlooked the evidence supplied above. In addition to Matthew 12, 28 and Luke 4, several texts directly or indirectly state that Christ performed his miracles with a derived power. Two, they ignore the clear implications of the Jesus' prayer in John 11 that he was enabled by God, the Father, to raise Lazarus. Three, they fail to distinguish between texts that report our Lord's hundreds of miracles and those that explain the modus operandi of those miracles. The texts that explain how or by what power those miracles were performed. The miracles of the apostles. The apostles sought to prove to Israel that Jesus was in fact Lord in Christ. Their preaching and miracles point to that fact. They may point to Christ's deity. I say that hesitantly. There are three texts I would like you to read with care. Acts 3, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. Acts 4, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Acts 9, and Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed, and immediately he rose. The apostles suggest that they heal on the basis of the authority of Christ. This may point to his deity, but it might just as easily point to his acquired authority as the victorious Messiah. The implication of the book of Acts is that they healed with the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Conclusion, as God's anointed servant, our Lord performed his miracles. That is, he performed them in the power of the Holy Spirit. These miracles serve to authenticate him as Messiah. The miracles of the apostles also point to the authority of Christ's messianic office. They may also have the effect of pointing to Christ's deity, as Christ attributed his miracles to the Holy Spirit's power, so the apostles now attributed their miracles to the authority of the risen and exalted Christ. Luke also implies, however, that they exercise these miraculous gifts with the power of the Spirit. Questions? I've given this uh, talk before. I've sort of answered some questions, maybe not sufficiently well, but uh, I've, had to, I've had to. These are questions that students have brought up over the years. Does not John 2.11 suggest that Jesus displayed his deity when he turned the water into wine? The beginning of this sign Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and the disciples believed in him. My response is, as John proceeds with his gospel, it becomes clearer that Christ's glory was not openly displayed. Everyone did not perceive it. Paradoxically, his true glory was seen not in outward splendor, but in the lowliness with which the Son of God lived among us and suffered for us. His glory was a moral splendor, the glorious life of service lived by Christ and laid down for others in his crucifixion. Second, does not our Lord's authority to lay down his life and take it up again point to his own essential deity? The text suggests that the Lord received this authority from my Father. And uh, in the New Testament, the resurrection is often referred to the Father. Does not the miracle of the healing of the paralytic point to the deity of Christ? The text suggests that as Messiah, note the title, human, the human title, Son of Man, he had authority derived from God to forgive sin and to heal. Does not John 20, 31 suggest that Jesus' miracles were designed to prove that he was the Son of God, essentially divine? I, respond, I would respond that while John emphatically teaches the deity of Christ, the purpose of the miracles was to prove Jesus' Messiahship. Jesus is the Christ. It's important to remember that the title Son of God is used of Christ in three distinct ways. 
It's used of eternal sonship. This has also been called ontological sonship, divine sonship, essential sonship. The title Son of God speaks, first of all, of Christ's essential deity. The designation Son of God is a metaphysical designation and tells us that what he is in his being of being. He is the one who was one with the Father and has been sent into the world. Incarnational or nativity sonship. In Luke's gospel, the origin of Christ's human nature is ascribed to his mother Mary and to the direct supernatural paternity of God. For that reason, the angel says he is called son of God. Messianic sonship. This is also been called official sonship, incarnate sonship, acquired sonship. As David's son, Jesus, viewed in his manhood, was adopted or appointed as God's son. Now, on that word adopted, I want to just go down to footnote 36. Um, the term adoption was incorrectly used by the adoptionists of the second and eighth centuries. They taught that Jesus was a man who became God by adoption. We reject this ancient heresy. The New Testament teaches that Christ in his divine nature is the eternal son of God, yet he is in his human nature, the messianic son. God the son took a human nature and in that human state as David's son, in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant was adopted as God's son. Jesus is not only the eternal son, he's also the messianic son. You remember in 2 Samuel that uh, David has promised that his, uh, his lineage will be sons of God. They will be sons of God. In light of the in this third sense, Christ becomes God's son at his resurrection ascension. In light of the connection of the two titles, namely Christ and son of God in John 20, 31, I'm inclined to think that John is speaking here of messianic sonship. Beasley Murray writes, for Jews, Messiah and son of God would be synonymous, the latter being understood in adoptionistic terms in line with the second Psalm where the king at his coronation enters on the status of the Son of God. Now a little caveat where I start wobbling at the knees about being so strong in my assertions. A number of scholars have argued that there is a development of understanding in the Gospels regarding the title Son or Son of God. F.F. F. Bruce is an example. He quotes the confession of Nathaniel in John 1 Rabbi, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. And he comments, he addresses Jesus by the courtesy title rabbi, but proceeds to give him far loftier designations than that. In effect, he acclaims him as Messiah using two messianic titles conjoined in the second Psalm where God says to the anointed king of Israel, enthroned on the holy hill of Zion, you are my son, Today I have begotten you. To the evangelist, John, as he wrote, the Son of God had a much greater depth of meaning than this, but we need not suppose that at such an early stage in his career as a disciple, Nathaniel meant much more by it than he meant by King of Israel. They were alternate ways of denoting the Messiah. Bruce clearly suggests that John had a deeper understanding of Son of God namely eternal sonship than Nathaniel's understanding. W.D. Davies and Dale Allison imply two uses of the term in Matthew as well. At his baptism and at the stilling of the storm, it is a messianic title. Yet in Matthew 11 and in Peter's great confession, it's more. So Davies and Allison feel that early on, Son of God is just messianic. But then with Peter's great confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, it is more. It speaks of the secret personal relationship Jesus alone has with the Father, that is ontological or eternal sonship. George R. Beasley Murray in his comments on John 20, 30 and 31 suggests that by the end of his gospel, John is using son of God in the more elevated sense. 
He writes, in this gospel, the Son of God is the key concept of the relation of Jesus to God being strictly synonymous with the absolute use of, quote, the Son. Consequently, the term Messiah is also raised in significance. He is the king of the savings. He is the king of the saving sovereignty who belongs to the new creation. And the inscription on the cross implies that he achieves his kingdom in the exaltation via the cross to the right hand of God. The content of Christological faith in verse 31 is not to be viewed as a lower Christology than that of Thomas's confession. Just before this, John is, Thomas says, of course, uh, my Lord and my God, but must be understood in its light and filled out by it. And the end of such confession of Jesus, Messiah and Son of God is life in his name, the eternal life of the new age. So where does this bring me in my thinking? I still strongly affirm that our Lord while on earth functioned as a man and performed his mighty deeds in the power of the spirit. I would still argue that his miracles were designed to prove that he was truly Israel's Messiah. Yet I would also agree with those who argue that the net effect of these miracles is that they do point to his deity. I would add nevertheless that Thomas's confession and John's addendum in 20, 30, and 31 are post-resurrection remarks about the Lord. Certainly the age of John would use the title Son of God in the highest Christological sense, that is eternal or ontological sonship. This deeper understanding of Son of God came toward the end of our Lord's ministry, and especially after the events of Peter's great confession, Golgotha and Easter morning. <coughs> No comments, I guess you're all completely convinced. We'll go home. Uh, I will accept questions or, or uh, push back critiques. Will you make a distinction versus the exalted Lord in his post-resurrection? He says four times in John 6 um, that I will raise, raise him up in the last day. And he speaks there in uh, John 6 of uh, the resurrection of believers. Finish your thought. Well, I say, do you make a distinction? Would you make a distinction and say, in the exalted Lord will accomplish that resurrection of believers as the divine Son? Well, the Father who raises Jesus from the dead um, I'd have to think about that, John. I'm uh, Jack. Certainly, Jesus is given. In John 5, he's given uh, authority to be the final judge, the judge in the last day. As for that question, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put that in my list of questions with an answer after I've thought about it. I'd like to, I'd like to go beyond this, but um, a sticking point for this um, interpretation, understanding of how the Lord performed in our place. has been John 2, 11, which I think you attempt to address, but not satisfy. Um, because in John 2, 11, it's the turning of water into wine, and the song on your hand on page seven at the bottom. <clears throat> so this beginning of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in it. Now, you proceed to say it is the moral glory of the Lord, 
However, it is the power of transmuting substance from one elemental form to another that is really involved. And even the prologue of John, when it speaks of the word became flesh, dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, that really is the echo of the divine self disclosure on Mount Sinai. Uh, and so while there is moral glory to the Lord, I don't think this verse fits that explanation. Well, a qu uh, the question I, or the answer, I suppose that I would uh, give to this, again, is how does this verse fit with the other verses I've cited yes. that say that he did this in the power of the Spirit? And Peter says the same thing in, in Acts. So, did he manifest, uh, he manifested his glory as what? as messiah how did he do this miracle with a with a derived authority or was it an imperial authority so let me post the, the converse to you could it be said of any of the prophetic miracles or even the apostolic miracles that they did this manifesting elijah did this as manifesting his glory i don't think so well, he wasn't Messiah. Manifested his glory as Messiah. I see. I see what you're saying. Hmm? So there, so the manifesting the glory as a Messiah could be acceptable were it not for the prologue, I think. Where the glory is directly tied to the person. Well, this gospel is written by someone who at the very outset says that Jesus is God. Yes. He's God. Uh, but this very same gospel, the raising of Lazarus, Jesus, I thank you, Father, that you have heard me, uh, implying he had enabled him to raise Lazarus or, from the dead. The Son of Man can do nothing of himself. Yeah. I mean, those are all acknowledged. Yeah. And it is still, so the question then is if this, um, um, are we, are we? I would say, I would say, as you're thinking of that thought, <laughs> <laughs> I would say that we have to remember, John is written after the resurrection uh, when he is fully cognizant of Christ's deity. The question is, while on earth, while he and the, uh, you know, Nathaniel says that uh, you're, uh, what does he say exactly, you know, you are the king of Israel. Correct. Yeah, son of God, <laughs> king of Israel. Right. Does he, does he mean that, uh, Nathaniel Christ is God? Nathaniel doesn't. No. Nathaniel means he is the Davidic Messiah. And what is being conveyed to different people as they see Jesus perform these miracles? I have to say, you, you've got to deal with the verses I've given. These verses that clearly say he does them in the power of the Spirit. The Father does them through him. And... Uh, a man attested to you, a man, Peter says, he hadn't yet read John's gospel. A man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him. Okay. So what do you, what do you say? Uh, John 2.11 is affirming. I am saying that maybe we are splitting more hairs than we should. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it is important to recognize that he was truly human and came and lived a life in full obedience to the will of the Father. His life was a life of obedience. And that is a new role. 
And yet, it seems to me in John 2.11 that John and all of the New Testament is written post-resurrection, right? So unless you are quoting the actual dialogues during the public ministry, it is irrelevant. It's all post-resurrection. So the author's voice is the author is writing after the resurrection and ascension. So here he is saying, when he changed water to wine, he manifested his body and the disciples believed on him. Because so you, that is messianic glory, I suppose. Um, I, I have a little difficulty because of the proximity of the prologue to John chapter two. Well, I just have to read the prologue and the end of the gospel as these are these are truths fully made fully clear. Uh, in a post-resurrection. No, but, but, but even that applies even to the stuff in between, because John is writing, even commenting on other things, that these things they didn't understand before, after the resurrection they understood it better. So those comments are the in between you, not in the prologue and epilogue. But in the prologue, the reference to the glory of the Messiah is the divine glory. Okay. In all of the okay. other names. Well, I'm not denying. Uh, I have. Well, the the unique unique Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, can I jump in? And... I, I've written on the prologue, and I have said all of this about the prologue. I agree with you on the prologue. Yeah. yeah. So, in in chapter five, after third son appearing to the man in the pool. Um, the Jews are upset because he's doing these things on the Sabbath. And Jesus says in verse 17, my father is working until now, and I am working. And then they respond, um, desiring to kill him because he was making himself equal with God by mm -hmm. saying he was working. And then, you know, so there is a sense of the, the sun, the divine sun working. There's a sense in which the miracles, Jesus can say that he does the works. There's a sense in which he pointed out in John 14, 10, that the Father does the works through him. And there's a sense in which he does them by the power of the Spirit. So... He does them. To, he does them, Mark. All three members of the Godhead are involved in the works of the miracles, thus demonstrating that they are the works of God, which fits with our concept of inseparable operations, that all three members of the Godhead are at work in the great works of Yeah, but I want I I, I want to uh, I want to keep the function somewhat separate. The father did not die on the cross. No. Je the son died on the cross. Right. No, so right. we. But Jesus can say, I'm doing the works, but the father is working through me, demonstrating these are, are God's works. Well, look. And the they are. In six and in five. In five, yes. you know, that's been both to the father and to the son. <laughs> and, and, and even in 11, when he. He raises the dead, raises Lazarus. He makes this claim, I am the resurrection and the light. And he says to Mary, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So that's another connection. With the yeah. Glory. Yeah. I agree. Jesus performed these miracles. Yeah. I am working. Yes, my father's working. I am working. Yeah, the question I'm is, working. the question is, with what? Was it a derived power? Was he functioning as a man? Or are you going to go to a patristic idea that some of them were done in the power of the spirit, some of them are done by the son? What I don't I don't think well, you can split the, the I don't spirit. think you can split the, the uh, all person. All of them were done in the power of the spirit, and all of them were done by the son. All of the miracles were done by the son. Yeah. That's true. In the power of the they spirit. are they, but with what power? With the power of the spirit. Exactly. The power. 
Acts, you, you know, you people are fighting against the Apostle Peter. Yes, yes you are. Uh, which God performed through him. I'm not denying that. Okay, he performed the miracles. It's, it's not either or, is what it, I think we're trying to say. No, the question, yeah, Mark, it, the question is not whether Jesus performed miracles. I agree he did. No. Okay, so... With what power? Was it derived power or was it his own divine power? So you're even sort of giving a caveat at the end of John. Thomas, the, the climax of the book is when Thomas responds, my Lord and my God, to be called in his son. Right. Post-resurrection, right. And, and, and right after that, there is this, John explained the purpose of the book many other signs he did these are written that you may believe both that he is the messiah and the son of god the signs demonstrate both those things well not the son of god is a messianic title uh colin brown says even at that verse even there it is to be understood messianically i i'm i'm up in the air on that yeah but Jesus himself in John 5 explains his sonship, revealing that he is, he is God. I am working, the Father is working, as a, a revelation of his equality with the Father. It would have been upset with him if he said, I'm doing these works through God, which had been no different than the prophets, right? It would have been different if he was saying, I'm working on the Sabbath. The this, this statement that uh, the Father does this through the Son is also the statement of uh, the Son's work of creation. All things came into being through him. And you could say that God was the creator, but through the Son. Did the Son perform his creation in a derived power or as God the Son? Well, beginning with John 1, the Son. What I'm talking, uh, I think we're ignoring the uh, kenosis, you know, the... Uh, but that, the that was Jack's argument, he is coming back against the kenosis. Hmm? So the Son's work of creation is pre-kenosis. But the instrumentality is clearly stated in Hebrews 1. Or agency, immediate agency of the Son. That's three points. Okay, I'm talking about his earthly I know, ministry. But, but the, the point is, if the same language can be used of the work of creation, how does that then provide an argument for the distinction you are making in regard to the incarnate ministry? Well, that's the, that's the distinction. Incarnation. Uh, giving up the voluntary use of his divine attributes. Did he did he function as a man truly? Uh, and I want to I want to hold on to that that he functioned as a man. I think that's at the heart of understanding a lot of the Book of Hebrews is that he was a man. Yeah. And uh, as far as I am working, yeah, okay, he's working, but while on earth, he's working with not imperial power, but derived power. But the argument in the, in the, John, in the John 5 passage, no prophet who performed any miracle in the derived power of the Holy Spirit would be able to say, I did this on the Sabbath because God does it on the Sabbath and I am working on the okay, Sabbath. My so, works on the okay, Sabbath. Okay, what I want, I want you to tell me then what you are saying. What are you, you're just quoting scripture there, now interpret for me. Well, are he, you saying that at that point he is independently using his own power? The Father does it and I do it too. With my power, it's it's a it's a 
It's a thing that no prophet would be able to say because it was a statement of his equality with God. And that's what Mark, what you were saying, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, and he says, for whatever the Father does, the Son, that the Son does likewise. Mm -hmm. How does he do it? Well, I think he, he, the fact that he does it demonstrates something about the nature of his deity. Well, but what uh, well how what do you do with these verses, Mark? The, the my my proof texts, as it were. What do you do I with those? I want to read them into John five. I want to let John five stand. Well, yeah, but we we hand. that helps me see that all three members of the Godhead are involved in the works of Jesus. So yes, I think the miracles um, can demonstrate the deity of Christ. But there's also the reality that um, he was, you know, he was, he had humbled himself and he wasn't just drawing on divine attributes, you know, to make his own path easier, I think Walton says. Um, but when he was doing signs, the signs were designed to demonstrate that he was both Messiah and Son of God. I think that's John's argument. Well, I would argue that... In light of the prologue, in light of... Yeah. Well, I think the purpose was to prove his Messiahship. And I take Son of God there in the uh, Messianic sense. I, I, think, I think it's extremely appropriate to say the miracles of Jesus should not be used as a direct evidence of his deity because... Many of those, all of those categories, except for the resurrection, his own glorified resurrection from the dead, are manifest in the ministry of the apostles and of the prophets. So that point is, is well taken in, in, in all of them. I wonder, I wonder here if, if this is one case where we are kind of maybe wrongly dividing between messianic sonship and ontological sonship because um, the, the Old Testament when it speaks of Messiah uh, it's not solely a human royal ruler right there is already implied in the Old Testament uh, Psalm 45 your throne O God is forever and ever so maybe it's not that John is trying to demonstrate both but that he is Messiah, and what Messiah means is King and God, and and yet the disciples don't understand both aspects of this. So this would, I think, this would maybe agree with both sides of this to demonstrate. That, so, like Isaiah 11, how is Messiah going to operate? He's going to be empowered by the Spirit. Exactly. And, um, but this doesn't doesn't say that he's not demonstrating both if you want to you know isolate these messiahship and deity these are really one one thing perhaps anyone else have any uh by the way is this uh being zoomed yeah it's probably shut off by now no i i started to turn it off and i noticed oh. that there's uh, someone still watching oh good okay <laughs> I was recording it. So. Okay. I had a thought, but I'm thinking better. <laughs> yeah, if I'd known it was being zoomed, I would have stood in back of the. Uh... Well, <laughs> the, the camera could still. Okay. See you, okay. So. All right. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Good.